How have the Palestinians been able to manipulate the media to make Israel appear the uh, bad guy in this conflict? Well, the Palestinians uh, proved to be masterpiece in this. When you have no respect to the truth, when everything goes, when you can tell the biggest lies possible, then you have no problem in bringing in information on the spot. I can tell you that I had many conversations with the IDF spokesman, asking them why, for example, the story of Adura took months until it was uh, confirmed that the Jewish, that the Israeli forces could not have shot that uh, he was in a crossfire and they could not have shot him. And therefore, uh, the whole thing was a, was a hoax. It took months and months to do that because the Israeli forces and the Israeli government wants to be, want to be sure that when they uh, put down a statement or put down a fact, that it's a true fact. Was it a, was it a libel? They were doing it to libel and slander Israel in the... In there the is no doubt about it. I mean, I, I, till now, nobody's sure that this Mohammed Adura really died. Nobody is sure about it. There is no evidence that he died. They did not show the body. We do not know that he died. But it is definite that it was not the uh, Israeli uh, forces who shot him. It was it, the, he was shot by, if, if he was shot, he was shot by, his, uh, uh, by the uh, Palestinians who were uh, actually uh, using acts of terror. So, but with the Arabs, it took them three minutes even less to state that Israel shot him and to give a story which is uh, uh, totally false and the, uh, the, 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 these uh, stories are captured by the foreign press because it is news it is news when Israel kills a, a Palestinian it's news when a Palestinian kills a Jew it's not news do you believe that the foreign press is expected to portray the Palestinians as the victims and the Israelis as the aggressor at this point, that that's, that's the storyline that the news agencies and news editors are expecting and anything that varies from that won't be depicted because it's no longer politically correct? Yes, I think we reached a situation whereby uh, Israel is always to blame. We reached a situation whereby it's much easier to say to put uh, uh, defamation uh, on Israel and it will be accepted very quickly. Uh, the, it doesn't go the other way around. I mean, because, first of all, because you don't expect, for example, from the terrorists of Gaza that they would uh, uh, have any uh, respect to human life. You don't expect that from them. But on the other hand, you have the double standard that with the uh, Israeli forces, with the Israeli government, you expect uh, much more than you would expect from anybody else. I mean, it's not so difficult to compare between Israel uh, in, the, uh, in Gaza or in the West Bank and the American and British forces in Afghanistan and in uh, other areas of dispute. And you can see that uh, there is much less concern for human life in those areas by British soldiers and American soldiers than you have by Israeli soldiers. You have, you know, I can say, uh, I can state a statement from uh, Aaron Barak, the Supreme Court judge, who said every soldier has the Geneva Convention in his pocket. And uh, soldiers who act against the Geneva Convention are punished. And uh, well, where do you have this in any other uh, uh, army in the world? What about the uh, Palestinian allegations that uh, in Operation Cast Lead, Israel uh, used uh, uh, armaments with white phosphorus? That's a, uh, a, a common criticism now. W was that done intentionally or you think accidentally? Well, first of all, if that's true, it was used on uh, military targets. You see, there's a confusion. What is a military? and what is a civilian. In the past, 
it was very simple to, identi to uh, identify uh, uh, an army from a civilian uh, population. Now, all the terrorists do not wear uniform, so they are considered civilians. So when you throw a bomb of this sort on civilian population, it's, it's forbidden, it's not allowed. But how do you, uh, how do you uh, define a civilian population? when those terrorists are in, in uh, plain clothes and uh, they uh, actually they are fighting uh, in, in a terrorist manner. So uh, I say, I, I don't know, I'm not sure whether this was uh, uh, proved, but if it did happen, uh, it happened on uh, military activities uh, who, had, who were carried out by terrorists than civilians. Israel would not uh, drop uh, phosphorus bombs on civilians, no way. As an academic now, have you been an academic most of your career? Well, for the last 30 years. And ha for how long have you been living in Israel on, th on this latest spell? You mentioned you, you lived uh, uh, abroad. Well, I was in England for five years, but uh, Where? I, I, um, I lived in Israel all my life. I was, uh, I was, uh, you would call me a refugee from Iraq uh, who came to Israel. Of course, if I was a Palestinian, I would have been a refugee. My father would have been a refugee. My children would have been a refugee. And my grandchildren would have been refugees. But as an Israeli, as a Jew, I wasn't a refugee even one day because when I came to my land, to my country, I was accepted immediately. And that's what's expected, that the uh, Jordanians and the Iraqis and the Egyptians should have absorbed the, uh, those Palestinian refugees, what they did not do. But they kept them in a, in a horrible situation because they promised them that they would go back to where? Not to Palestine but it's a Jewish state. And this is something that uh, there is no uh, precedent to that. What kind of work do you do in the Center for Mass Media with regard to uh, portraying I Israel's situation to the media? Well, the, uh, the uh, Center for Law and Mass Media actually was established after the Oslo Agreement. Uh, the Oslo Agreement, uh, we thought from the start, uh, that the Oslo Agreement was detrimental to the existence of Israel. It was uh, something that was uh, wrong and dangerous. And therefore, uh, the, uh, we established a research center to try to uh, find out the reasons for the conflict between uh, the Jews and the Arabs and how uh, would it be possible to come to terms of peace with the Arabs. We came to a conclusion going back to history, going back to religion, going back to the um, interaction, interrelations between Arabs and Jews in Arab countries, we came to the conclusion that in, in our uh, era, in our time, uh, peace is impossible. And we came to that conclusion uh, after uh, seeing that uh, the uh, Arabs, when they signed the Oslo Agreement, did not really mean to do peace. How does that bode then for the UN trying to pressure Israel? When you say there won't be peace, is that because Israel won't be peaceful with uh, with the Palestinians, uh, giving them a border? Or, well, let me let me put it this way: if the Jews stop fighting, the fighting will not stop. If the Arabs stop fighting, there will be no fighting. Which means, which shows you, that the fighting is initiated first and foremost by the Arabs. And it doesn't matter what you do. I mean, you try to appease them, you try to go uh, towards them, you try to uh, uh, make concessions, it doesn't work. The more you do, the more they ask for more. So, um, in the situation of today, uh, peace is not envisaged, not because the Israelis don't want to make peace. The Israelis have gone through concessions, terrible concessions. Uh, they gave up 
their most holy places, like uh, places in Jerusalem, like places in uh, in uh, Hebron, Bethlehem, uh, Ephrat, Shechem, that's Nablus. All these areas, Israel has given up uh, for the to the Palestinians uh, for the sake of peace. You will have all these places written in the Bible. And we were brought up on the Bible. The whole Christian uh, uh, hemisphere has, was brought up on the Bible. And I can tell you that the Quran is based on the Bible because the stories of the Bible, you find them in the Quran. And the Moses, for example, and Joseph are all prophets in the Quran while they are Jewish uh, personalities. So while everyone is publicly calling for a, a Palestinian state in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, Ariel is now in Samaria. Right. What would you see as the prospects for Ariel if uh, the Palestinians are given more uh, authority and, and Israel has to pull, has to has to draw its uh, police back from protecting the Israelis? Well, if Israel withdraws from Judea and Samaria there will be no Palestinian authority there. There will be Hamas. The whole thing will fall in the hands as there is, it's ripe to fall in the hands of the Hamas. And if it falls in the hands of the Hamas, then no plane would be able to uh, take off from Ben Gurion Airport. We'll have Iran over here and we have all the ter terrorist organizations over here and Israel will be in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, today, the only reason why the Palestinian Authority still exists in the West Bank is only because of the Israeli Defense Forces. Take away the Israeli Defense Forces, the whole thing will topple down. You could see how this happened in Gaza, and there is no reason why it would not happen in the West Bank. Therefore, uh, it's not a matter of uh, you know if withdrawing from uh, the West Bank and then leaving Ariel aside. Ariel actually is a is a city. It's a city of 20,000 people. When you say settlement, some people think that there's a few tents with a camel. It's not that. It's a big, huge city, and the university has 12,000 students, and you cannot just withdraw from, uh, from that area. Therefore, uh, President Obama is speaking about uh, the uh, swapping of areas, uh, one with the other, because it's, it's well understood by Israelis, by Americans, by Europeans, that you cannot withdraw from, from Ariel and from uh, the Gush Etzion. There are certain areas which are condensed areas. You cannot just withdraw from them. But um, if you withdraw from the other areas, the scattered uh, er uh, um, settlements in the uh, West Bank, then this will immediately have effect within Israel. You mentioned the Hamas uh, like an extension of the Taliban. Is, it, is, the, is Hamas the, uh, the Palestinian uh, 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 division of 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 the palace uh, of the uh, uh, Taliban and Al Qaeda is is that what Hamas represents? No, Hamas represents the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood is a pan Arab, uh, uh, shall we say, organization, uh, which sees in 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 their eyes that the whole region should be Arab. It's uh, it's a very uh, Muslim should be Muslim, should be Muslim and should be Arab, that uh, in fact that Israel has no right to exist. And, uh, and the Hamas is part of this. And I can tell you that uh, within Israel now, there is because of the um, liberal attitude of the laws in Israel on uh, uh, the freedom of speech and other freedoms, you can find Arabs who are working now to have nationhood within the state of Israel. Why? Oh, because they feel that they are part of Pan-Arabism, they are part of the uh, Islamic Brotherhood, and they feel that they have no connection with Israel. They want to have a, a, a separate uh, Muslim uh, canton within? Exactly. And they, w they want to have it in the, in the Galilee, because there is a big uh, a concentration of, of Arabs, and they want to have it in the Negev. And you can see that in the Negev, for example, that the uh, Bedouins, the Arabs, are, uh, uh, you know, uh, trespassing uh, land, 
uh, which belongs to the uh, to Israel, and they're building their houses over there. And if you try to demolish one of the houses because they were built without any license, then you have the whole thing, the whole Arab uh, population uh, demonstrate and come up with uh, with uh, even with. Uh, uh, throwing stones, throwing uh, uh, Molotov bombs, and uh, within Israel. But right now, Arabs have equal rights to to Jews in the state of Israel, don't they? Yeah, but they are not. But they they have equal rights in all uh, respects. But there are a few things that because it's a Jewish state. For example, the law of return doesn't apply to the Arabs. But uh, but the uh, Arabs and the Arabs do not serve in the army, but the Arabs have equal rights. And they can say what they want. I mean, uh, it's freedom of speech. It's freedom for all. More than they have in Arab countries. More than they have in... Uh, certainly more than they have in Gaza and in the West Bank. But if there's uh, a cultural war against Israel by Muslims, when, for example, in World War II, when the United States was attacked in Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, for defensive purposes, the U.S. chose to uh, take its Japanese citizens and separate them as a potential fifth column that would work against right. uh, in this war ag against the host country how can how can the arabs who who have this this uh, uh, muslim nationalism within israel how can israel uh, continue to to uh, allow them you know to to mix uh, uh, among them if there is in fact this muslim war i can tell you that in israel with all the risks that we are <coughs> going through the arabs have more rights than they have in any Arab country. And uh, we are taking calculated risks to give them those uh, fundamental and basic uh, rights uh, because uh, equality is one of the main uh, themes of the Israeli democracy. And this is very well guarded by the Supreme Court of Israel. And if anybody, if the government tries to uh, uh, put them in jeopardy, then you have the Supreme Court who will say, who will, who will give its decision. So in Israel, uh, uh, not alike what happened in the United States during the Second World War, in Israel this did not happen even though we were in a much more dangerous position than the United States was uh, during Pearl Harbor. There is no doubt that Israel is standing in the front of the Western civilization. There is no doubt that Israel is getting the whole uh, brunt of the, uh, of the Muslims and the Arabs, uh, especially those who are extremists. And uh, uh, Israel actually should be backed much more by the United States and Europe than it is actually backed. One cannot understand how uh, countries like Norway, like uh, Ireland, back the Palestinians with all these uh, uh, horrible uh, lack of rights in those areas against women, against uh, homosexuals, against uh, uh, their own people. Uh, they shoot them in the legs, they shoot them, uh, they, 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 there's no judge justice, there is, and they back them against a little tiny democratic state who is uh, surrounded by 250 million Arabs, like in a ghetto, and, uh, and surrounded even further by 1 billion, 100 million uh, uh, Muslims all over the world, and uh, who uh, vote in the United Nations uh, automatically. I mean, if the uh, Palestinians come up and say uh, that uh, a cow is a horse, they will, they will vote for that. And uh, it doesn't matter what they say. So in a situation like this, I wonder why the Western world, the uh, educated world, the democratic world, does not back Israel much more uh, than it does. And you can see this now in the United Nations with having uh, voting for Palestine. I mean, after all, Palestine is a terrorist entity, even today. I don't see any democracy there. I don't see any... Uh, rights, any liberal rights, there is racism. You can imagine that the Palestinians say, we won't have any Jew living in the West Bank if we form a Palestinian state. And why is that? Why a Jew cannot live among Palestinians? I mean, they say that we are ra the Jews are racist. How come they say that? 
they are even worse than the uh, than the Germans during the Nazi area. And so, what does tolerating an Islamist state of Palestine? How would that bode for the global jihad and the Western civilization resistance to this jihadist movement? Well, the jihadist movement is an extreme movement who wants to annihilate uh, the Jewish state. Uh, first and foremost, and it wants to topple down the regimes, the Christian regimes in Europe, and uh, the uh, Europe is still dormant. It's it hasn't uh, really woken up enough. Uh, the British are feeling this now very well. Uh, the Germans felt that before, and you have this uh, awakening also in in Holland. Uh, you can you can imagine that the situation has changed tremendously in the last five years or, or say three years um, before there was uh, uh, the uh, Europe was uh, for uh, equality with, with with the Muslims and, uh, and and feeling that they could absorb them within within themselves but now they are they came to the conclusion that this is impossible and they are starting to awaken now and how about the uh, jihadist threat in the United States? Is that, does that concern you too? It does. It does very much. Because what happens in the United States affects Israel uh, very much. And, uh, you know, until September 11th, uh, the United States did not really grasp the danger of the Islamist extremist uh, against Israel. Things changed since September 11th. And why is that? because the danger came to the doors of the United States. The United States is the, uh, the greatest democratic state in the world. And uh, all democracies, actually, live by the democracy of the United States. And uh, we want to see America strong. I think that what's happening in the Middle East would not have happened if, we had, if, if America had a stronger government uh, with uh, you know its feet on the f on the ground, and I feel that the unfortunately um, the the danger that is happening in in democratic countries is not well absorbed, not well seen by the American administration at this stage. And so, as we're approaching the next election, the the new presidential election cycle, how would you advise? Uh, uh, Westerners to perceive uh, the global stability? Well, I think that uh, uh, it all stems from the United States. And uh, I would say that the uh, democratic countries in Europe and Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, all these uh, are under the umbrella, the American umbrella. And therefore, uh, those elections. Uh, I don't want to go into uh, internal uh, elections of the United States. It's not my, uh, it's not my job, and I don't want to do that. But on the whole, I I hope that uh, the administration in the United States will be stronger, and uh, influence those countries like Turkey, like Iran, in a much stronger manner. That uh, stability uh, is what America wants, and to make stability is to end the conflict uh, in uh, between between religions between nations uh, the whole thing in turkey for example is, is unacceptable and ununderstandable uh, after all turkey and israel were very good friends and uh, the only reason for uh, the attacks of uh, erdogan the prime minister of turkey is to uh, to to lead the uh, Arab world or the Islamic world in the area. So you see, to lead the Islamic world in the area is to attack Israel. You can see the, uh, the psychology of the whole man. What can the public do to uh, support the uh, Ariel Center's uh, mass media and law center? Well, first of all, uh, we are looking for uh, understanding. We are looking for um, mainly for financial <coughs> aid. We need that uh, very badly because donations. We donations. Yes, we cannot uh, actually survive and act without uh, making a lot of 
to disseminate information and to uh, bring them to the uh, to the knowledge of the public this really is very costly because you've got to publish papers you've got to publish books you've got to go on the media this is uh, very uh, it, it, it's it's uh, you need funding for that and uh, because we are not a commercial institute so we don't have we, we have to uh, depend very much on outside funding and uh, this is one of the reasons I am uh, visiting the West Coast because we have uh, very good friends over here and I hope that uh, we'll uh, manage to uh, have this funding uh, if there's anyone who thinks that he could contribute I'll be very happy about that are you setting up uh, symposia to bring in liberal journalists and liberal news editors and, and the uh and the, the mainstream media, both Israeli and and foreign press, to your uh, university setting. Yes, we are having. We're going to have a conference uh, in late December, and the conference will be on the two-state solution and also on the uh, minorities in Israel and their effect as uh, as citizens in Israel. And of course, we uh, bring in uh, foreign press as well as Ra Israeli press, and uh, we are mainly interested in the Arab press, for example, in Jazeera and Al Arabia, uh, uh, to have uh, their uh, delegations to our conference, and uh, also to give uh, uh, coverage of uh, what we are saying and what we are doing. After all, we're not doing anything secret. Will this uh, be uh, webcast, or the the proceedings be made public as to what goes on? Yeah, uh, it, by the end of the conference, we'll uh, of course publish uh, the uh, the conclusions, the lectures, and uh, the uh, ideas, and we'll start a public debate and try to convince and try to influence on people uh, to uh, debate our. Uh, uh, our conclusions and uh, to to find out the right way. After all, what we are trying to do is to find the right way that Israel could live among nations and particularly among the Arabs. So uh, this is one of the reasons of the conference. Summary uh, for the academics in Great Britain who would urge boycotting Israeli academic. What would you say to these, uh, not just Britain, but uh, international uh, academicians who, are, uh, who think they can affect change? Well, you see, boycott does not help academic uh, learning. And uh, it's, it's totally wrong. It's, uh, you can't put politics into uh, research. Research is looking for the truth. And politics is, 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 is the opposite. So you cannot have one mixed with the other. The trouble is that, uh, for example, in Britain, some universities started the boycott against uh, Israel, uh, Israeli uh, cultural uh, institutions and uh, academic institutions and also universities. And this is, uh, this is wrong. It's not going to lead anywhere. And I'm, you know, I'm surprised. After all, I, w I lived in England for five years, and I was at Cambridge University. And this is totally uh, strange to me. I did not uh, encounter uh, this situation uh, at that time. And uh, it's amazing for, uh, for uh, uh, highly educated uh, people like the British that they uh, take into uh, boycotting and into uh, um, de defamation of, of, of the Jewish people in general. And, uh, you know, that uh, Israelis are not uh, inclined to, to go to Britain because uh, they are um, not very happy of uh, being arrested in uh, in, uh, by the uh, English courts, which is also absurd. You have the terrorists uh, making every act of, uh, of terror and going to Britain and, and preaching terror in Britain, that's okay. But when, uh, for example, Tzibi Libni, who was a firm foreign minister, did not uh, set foot on Britain, Britain just because uh, uh, there was a fear that uh, she would uh, be uh, arrested. That's absurd.